going to read for a little bit so I get tired, if that's okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. So far away, I feel like I'm like a bad stand-up comedian. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to read a little bit. Uh, it's like early on in the book. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, actually, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to read. I suppose that's exactly the problem. I wasn't raised to know any better. My, far, my father was Carl Jung, rest his soul, a social scientist of some renown. As the founder and, to my knowledge, sole practitioner of the field of liberation psychology, he liked to walk around the house, aka the Skinner box, in a laboratory coat, where I, his gangly, absent-minded black lab rat, was homeschooled in strict accordance with Piaget's theory of cognitive development. I wasn't fed. I was presented with lukewarm, appetitive stimuli. I wasn't punished, but broken of my unconditional, unconditioned reflexes. I wasn't loved, but brought up in an atmosphere of calculated intimacy and intense levels of commitment. We lived in Dickens, a ghetto community on the southern outskirts of Los Angeles. And as odd as it might sound, I grew up on a farm in the inner city. Founded in 1868, Dickens, like most California towns except for Irvine, which was established as a breeding ground for stupid, fat, ugly white Republicans and the Chihuahuas and East Asian refugees who loved them, started out as an agrarian community. The city's original charter stipulated that Dickens shall remain free of Chinamen, Spanish of all shades, dialects, and hats, Frenchmen, redheads, city slickers, and unskilled Jews. However, the founders, in their somewhat limited wisdom, also provided that the 500 acres bordering the canal be forever zoned for something referred to as residential agriculture. And thus my neighborhood, a 10 square block section of Dickens, unofficially known as the Farms, was born. You know when you've entered the farms, because the city sidewalks, along with your rims, car stereo, nerve, and progressive voting record will have vanished into, thick, into air thick with the smell of cow manure, and if the wind is blowing in the right direction, good weed. Grown men slowly pedal dirt bikes and fix you through the streets, clogged with gaggles and cubbies of every type of farm bird from chickens to peacocks. They ride by with no hands, counting small stacks of bills, looking up just long enough to raise an inquisitive eyebrow and mouth. What's up? Hey, whoa. Wagon wheels nailed to front yard trees and fences lend the ranch, lend the ranch style houses a touch of pioneer authenticity that belies the fact that every window, entryway, and doggy door has more bars on it and padlocks than a prison commissary. Front porch senior citizens and eight-year-old kids who've already seen it all sit on rickety lawn chairs, whittling with switchblades, waiting for something to happen, and it always did. For the 20 years I knew him, Dad had been the interim dean of the Department of Psychology at West Riverside Community College. For him, having grown up as a stable manager's son on a small horse ranch in Lexington, Kentucky, farming was nostalgic. But when he came out west with a teaching position, the opportunity to live in a black community and breed horses was too good to pass up, even if he'd never really been able to afford the mortgage and the upkeep. Maybe if he'd been a comparative psychologist, some of the horses and cows would have lived past the age of three and the tomatoes would have had fewer worms. But in his heart, he was more interested in black liberty than in pest management and the well-being of the animal kingdom. And in his quest to unlock the keys to mental freedom, I was his Anna Freud, his little case study. When he wasn't teaching me how to ride, he was replicating famous social science experiments with me as both the control and experimental group. Like any primitive Negro child lucky enough to reach the formal operational stage, I've come to realize that I had a shitty upbringing that I'll never be able to live down. I suppose if one takes into account the lack of ethics, the lack of an ethics committee to oversee my dad's child rearing methodologies, the experiment started innocently enough. In the early part of the 20th century, the behaviorist Watson and Rayner, in an attempt to prove that fear was a learned behavior, exposed nine-month-old little Albert to neutral stimuli like white rats, monkeys, and sheaves of burned newsprint. Initially, the baby test subject was unperturbed by the series of simians, rodents, and flames. But after Watson repeatedly paired the rats with unconsciously loud noises, over time, little Albert developed the fear not only of white rats, but of all things furry. When I was seven months, Pops place objects like toy police cars, cold cans of packed blue ribbon, Richard Nixon campaign buttons, and a copy of The Economist in my bassinet. But instead of conditioning me with a deafening clang, I learned to be afraid of the presented stimuli because they were accompanied by him taking out the family 38 special and firing several window rattling rounds into the ceilings while shouting, nigger, go back to Africa, loud enough to make himself heard over the quadraphonic console stereo blasting Sweet Home Alabama in the living room. 
To this day, I've never been able to sit through even the most mundane TV crime drama. I have, a strange affinity, I have a strange affinity for Neil Young. Whenever I have trouble sleeping, I don't listen to recorded rainstorms or crashing waves, but to the Watergate tapes. Family lore has it that from ages one to four, he tied my right hand behind my back so I grew up to be left-handed, right-brained, and well-centered. I was eight when my father wanted to test the bystander effect as it applies to the black community. He replicated the famous Kitty Genovese case with a prepubescent me standing in, standing in for the ill-fated Miss Genovese, who in 1964 was robbed, raped, and stabbed to death in the apathetic streets of New York. Her plaintive Psychology 101 textbook cries for help, ignored by dozens of onlookers and neighborhood residents. Hence, the bystander effect. The more people around to provide help, the less likely one is to receive help. Dad hypothesized that this didn't apply to black people a loving race whose very survival had been dependent upon helping one another in times of need. So he made me stand on the busiest intersection in the neighborhood, dollar bills bursting from my pockets, the latest and shiniest electronic gadgetry, electron, sorry, <laughs> electronic gadgetry jammed into my ear canals, a hip-hop heavy gold chain hanging from my neck, and, an inexplic and inexplicably, a set of custom-made carpet Honda Civic floor mats draped over my forearm like a waiter's towel. And as tears streamed from my face, I can't even see, sorry. And as tears streamed from my eyes, my own father mugged me. He beat me down in front of a throng of bystanders who didn't stand by for long. The mugging wasn't two punches to the face old when people came, not to my aid, but to my father. Assisting him in my ass kicking, they very happily joined in with flying elbows and television wrestling throws. One woman put me in a well executed and, in retrospect, merciful rear naked chokehold. And I regained consciousness to see my father surveying her and the rest of my attackers, their faces still sweaty, their chest still heaving from the efforts of their altruism. I imagined that, like mine, their ears were still ringing with high-pitched screams and their frenzied laughter. How satisfied were you with your act of selflessness? Not at all, somewhat satisfied, very satisfied. On the way home, Pops put a consoling arm around my aching shoulders and delivered an apologetic lecture about his failure to take into account the bandwagon. Then there was a the time he wanted to test servility and obedience in the hip-hop generation. I must have been about 10 when my father sat me down in front of a mirror, pulled a Ronald Reagan Halloween mask over his head, pinned a defunct pair of Transworld Airlines captain wings to his lab coat, and proclaimed himself a white authority figure. The, <laughs> the nigger in the mirror is a stupid nigger, he explained to me, in that screechy, cloying, white voice that comedians of color use while attaching a set of electrodes to my temples. The wires led to a sinister-looking console filled with buttons, dials, and old-fashioned voltage gauges. You will ask the boy in the mirror a series of questions about his supposed nigger history from a sheet on the table. If he gets the question wrong or fails to answer in 10 seconds, you will press the red button, delivering an electric shock that will increase in intensity with each wrong answer. I knew better than to beg for mercy. For mercy would be a rant about getting what I deserve for reading that one comic book I ever owned. Batman number 203, Spectacular Secrets of the Batcave Revealed, a moldy dog-eared back issue someone had thrown into the farmyard, and I brought inside a nurse back to read it. Oh, I brought inside a nurse back to readability like a wounded piece of literature. It was the first thing I'd ever read from the outside world. When I whipped it out during my break in my home during a break in my homeschooling, my father confiscated it. From then on, whenever I didn't know something or had a bad day in the neighborhood, he waved the comics half-torn cover in my face. See, if you weren't wasting your life reading this bullshit, you realize that many come to save your ass for your people. I read the first question. Prior to declaring independence in 1957, the West African nation of Ghana was comprised of what two colonies? I didn't know the answer. I cocked my ears for the roar of the rocket-propelled Batmobile screeching around the corner, but could only hear my father's stopwatch ticking down the seconds. I gritted my teeth, placed my finger over the red button and waited for the time limit to expire. The answer is Togo Land and the Gold Coast. Obediently, as my father predicted, I pressed the button. The needles on the dial and my spine both straightened. While I watched myself in the mirror jitterbug violently for a second or two. Jesus. How many volts was that, I asked, my hand shaking uncontrollably. The subject will only ask questions that are listed on the sheet, my dad said coldly, reaching past me to turn a black dial a few clicks to the right so that the indicator now rested on Triple X. Now, please read the next question. 
I began to suffer from a blurring of vision I suspected was psychosomatic, but nonetheless everything was out of focus as a $5 bootleg video on a swap meet flat screen. And to read the next question, I had to hold the quivering paper to my nose. Of the 23,000 eighth grade students who took the entrance exam for admission to Stuyvesant High School, New York's most elite public high school, how many African Americans scored high enough to qualify for admission? When I finished reading, my nose began to bleed. Red droplets of blood trickling from my left nostril and popping onto the table in perfect one second intervals. Issuing his stopwatch, my father started the countdown. I glanced suspiciously, suspiciously at him. The questions were too topical. Obviously, he'd been reading the New York Times at breakfast. Prepping for the day's experiment by looking for racial fodder over a bowl of Rice Krispies. Flipping from page to page with a speed and rage that caused the paper's sharp corners to snap, crackle, and pop in the morning air. What would Batman do if he rushed into the kitchen right now and saw a father electrocuting his son for the good of science? Why, he'd open up his utility belt and bust out some of those tear gas pellets. And when my dad was choking on the fumes, he'd finish asphyxiating him, assuming that there was enough bat rope to tie around his fat ass hot dog neck. Then he'd burn out his eyeballs with a laser torch, use the miniature camera to take some pictures for back posterity, then steals Pop's classic, only driven on trips to the white neighborhood sky blue Carmen via convertible with the skeleton keys, and we'd bone the fuck out. That's what Batman would have done. But me, cowardly bat fag that I was and still am, I could only think to question the question shoddy methodology. For instance, how many black students had taken an admissions test? What was the average class size at Stuyvesant and I? But this time, before the tenth drop of blood had landed on the table, and before my father could blurt out the answer, seven, I pressed the red button, self-administering a nerve-shattering, growth-stunting electric shock, a voltage that would have frightened Thor and lobotomized an already sedated and educated class. Because now, I too was curious. I wanted to see what happens when you bequeath a 10-year-old black boy to science. What I discovered was that the phrase, evacuate one's bowels, is a misnomer. Because the opposite was true. My bowels evacuated me. It was a feces retreat comparable to the great evacuations of history, Dunkirk, Saigon, New Orleans. But unlike the Brits, the Vietnamese capitalists, and the flooded out residents of the North Ninth War, the occupants of my intestinal tract had nowhere to go. What runny parts of that fetid tidal wave of shit and urine that didn't encamp itself around my buttocks and balls ran down my legs and pooled and pooled around my sneakers. Not wanting to hinder the integrity of his experiment, my father simply pinched his nose shut and motioned for me to proceed. Thank goodness I knew the answer to the third question. How many chambers are in the Wu-Tang? Because if, <laughs> because if I had, my brain would be the ash gray color and consistency of a barbecue briquette on the 5th of July. My crash course in childhood development ended two years later, when dad tried to replicate Dr. Kenneth and Amy Clark, Mamie Clark's study of color consciousness in black children using white and black dolls. My father's version, of course, was a little more revolutionary, a tad more modern. While the, Clark, where the Clarks had two cherubic, life-size, saddle-shoe-shod dolls, one white and one color, in front of, in, <laughs> sorry. While the Clarks sat two cherubic, life-size, saddle-shoe-shod dolls, one white and one color, in front of school children and asked them to choose the one they preferred, my father placed two elaborate doll skates in front of me and asked me, with whom, with what social cultural subtext are you down with son? Mm -hmm. Doll skate one featured Ken and Malibu Barbie dressed in matching bathing suits, appropriately snorkeled and goggled, cooling by the Dreamhouse pool. In doll skate two, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman, and a brown skin egg chef weevil toy were running and wobbling through a swampy thicket from a pack of plastic German shepherds leading an armed lynch party comprised of my G.I. Joes put in Ku Klux Klan sheets. What's that, I asked, pointing to a small white Christmas ornament that spun slowly over the bog, glittering and sparkling like a disco ball in the afternoon sun. That's the North Star. They're running toward the North Star, toward freedom. I picked up Martin, Malcolm, and Harriet, teasing my dad by asking, what are these, in-action figures? Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Martin Luther King Jr. looked okay, stylishly dressed in a glossy black tight-fitting suit, a copy of Gandhi's autobiography glued to one hand, and a microphone in the other. Malcolm was similarly outfitted, but was bespeckled and holding a burning Molotov cocktail that was slowly melting his hand. The smiling, racially ambiguous Weeble 
which looks suspiciously, suspiciously like a boyhood version of my father, stayed true to its advertising slogan by wobbling and never falling down. With a balance precariously in the palm of my hand, or chased by the knights of white supremacy, there was something wrong with Miss Tubman, though. She was outfitted in a form-fitting burlap sack, and I don't remember if any of my history primers describing the women known as Moses as being a statuesque 36, 24, 36, hourglass figure, long silky hair, plucked eyebrows, blue eyes, dick sucking lips, and pointy titties. Dad, you painted Barbie black. I wanted to maintain the beauty threshold, establish a baseline of cuteness so that you couldn't say one doll was prettier than the other. Plantation Barbie had a string coming out of her back. I pulled it. Math is hard. Let's go shopping, she said in a squeaky sing song voice. I set the black heroes back down on the kitchen table swamp moving their limbs so that they resume their runaway poses. I'm down with Ken and Barbie. My father lost his scientific objectivity and grabbed me by the shirt. What? Why, he yelled. Because the white people got better accessories. I mean, look, Harriet Tubman has a gas lantern, a walking stick, and a compass. Ken and Barbie have a dune buggy and a speedboat. It's really no contest. The next day, my father burned his findings in the fireplace. Even at the junior college level, it's published or perished but more than the fact that he never, he, he'd never get a parking space with his name on it or a reduced course load. I was a failed social experiment, a statistically insignificant son who shattered his hopes for both me and the black race. He made me turn in my dream book, stopped calling my allowance positive reinforcement, and began referring to it as restitution. While he never stopped pushing the book learning, it wasn't long after this that I brought my first spade, pitchfork, and sheep shearing razor sending me into the fields with a pat on, on the tush and Booker T. Washington's famous quote pinned to my denim overalls for encouragement. Cast down your bucket where you are. I think I'm stuck there. Thanks. <laughs> I feel so stupid standing up there. Can I sit on here or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Um, so we have some time for some questions. Um, we are recording, so I'm going to bring in my friend. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Fall, fall, fall. <laughs> turn everything upside down. Uh, inside out, folks. Yeah, that too. So tell me, what made you decide to write a book about that? Uh, yeah, I, I wish I had like a, a solid thing to point to, but I don't. I think uh, it's like a combination of three factors. So I'm from Los Angeles. Yeah, are you from LA? LA slash San Diego. LA slash San Diego. So maybe you know. So uh, when we were young, my mom would take my sisters, I guess this is late 60s, early 70s. It used to be a, a, a parade called the Watts Parade, which was like a. Uh, celebration of the, you know, having survived the Watts Rise. And so to get there, we lived in West LA, but to get there, we'd have to like drive through Compton. You guys have heard of Compton. So you would drive through Compton and you'd be going down Wilmington or something, and you would see people on horseback, like going to the store. And you just, you know, you go, okay, that's a little odd. <laughs> but, you know, you just never thought about it, you know. And uh, she, but she would also take us to this other neighborhood, Palisades, and we'd watch uh, people playing polo on horseback. So. And my sister and a good friend of mine teach in Compton, and you know, I went to visit them, and you know, there are chickens in this part of the city, like the street, you gotta stop and move the chickens, and people are grazing their cows and goats and stuff in the median of the street. It's just a weird neighborhood, and my sister says, like, kids bring uh, milk that they bought from the cow next door to class, you know, not from this, it's, just, it's a weird neighborhood. And uh, just stuck with me, I guess. And. Uh, and I also had this idea for a character named Hominy, who was Buckwheat's understudy and like the last surviving little rascals. And, I, and for some reason I had the concept of, you know how people are always saying, uh, I feel like I just heard, I can't remember who, I don't want to blame it on Spike, but somebody's saying like black people were better off under segregation, you know. You guys have all heard this, oh we had our own baseball, we had this, we had all this and all this kind of stuff. And I asked a friend of mine who was getting his doctorate in economics, I was like, is there like a thought, like, are there serious people who think about this? And he was like, yeah, there's some out there. And then, so, but it sparked in my head this idea of how can I put these three things I had been thinking about together? 
And I just really like the idea of trying to imagine what segregation would be like now, you know, in a place that's already <laughs> segregated, in a place that's multicultural but has no white citizens. You know, and also the thing, the, 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 the other concept that I had, was thinking about is a town that disappeared, you know. So it's like kind of how do you, and in L.A., like, black people are disappearing for a variety of reasons. And uh, I don't know, so I just kind of wanted, I know I'm taking a long time to answer this question, but these are things I was thinking about. And so I just didn't tell anybody what the book was about at all, you know, and I had this other thought of, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of The Little Rascals, and I saw a Little Rascals feature film called The Little General with a little spanky and a very little buckwheat, and they're kind of refighting the Civil War. And buckwheat is like basically Spanky's slave, which is so crazy. And so, I don't know, I just meshed all this stuff and came out with this book, and I just thought it was like a weird lens for going back in time and or going back through the present tense and the future in a weird way by kind of like seeing like how things have changed and haven't changed. Yeah, I, just, I don't I really know how to explain it. So there was no... Uh, Would you say you're a what-if guy? A what-if person? Yeah, what if we did this, this, this? Yeah, yeah I, I don't want to say that because, you know, somebody was talking about the book and, you know, everyone's saying satire and... My friend's friend said, no, it's not satire, it's reportage. This shit's all true, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, it, go ahead, man, what are you going to say? Help me. I'll, no, I'll wait for you to finish. But no, I'm done. Okay, no, I, I wanted to, yeah, because for me, it's, it's completely true. Like, it's my life, it's, it's the life of, um, you know, I had a mentor who's now passed away, but he was, you know, an ex hoodlum turned college professor at UC Santa Barbara who had a tall, skinny son who was a philosophy major at Antioch University who spoke a lot of weed and spoke the King's English. And, and I, I, See, I, I saw this. the book from that, right? Yeah, right I, I'm telling you, I saw this, but then like, and it's also like, like for me, I feel like, you know, I'm from New Orleans and, you know, I work for an environmental organization here on urban sustainability issues. And I go home, my mother works for an oil co company and you know, you know, my ex-con, ex-drug dealer cousin is now a developer who builds sprawl development. And and, and 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 for me, when I read it, it was like, you know, it's the story of someone who is in and from and a part of the community, but misunderstood by it. And it's just the cynicism that it brings because you understand so much but can't communicate yeah, with yeah. anyone. And and so I, I so for me, it was very personal on a whole lot of levels. So it's not satire; it's very real. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling this, but I teach every now and then at Columbia in New York. And I uh, was out with a friend and a student of mine, uh, uh, another young black man from Northern California. And my friend's about my age, Mexican-American. We were just talking about California. He's also from, from San Diego, actually. And uh, so we were just talking, and the, the student, he goes, made us feel really ill. He goes, I feel so sorry for you guys. You guys had it so bad, you know? <laughs> And, and, and it shocked me, because I was like, you know what's weird is, it, for me, it feels worse now. Because of just your, your outlook on how you interpret the events that are happening around you. Like, initially, they're, they're so afraid to write about being black, to like, because it's just, they feel that it just sends this weird message that, you know, no one will publish it, no one will read it, no one will like, and I'm just like, yeah, I think it's okay to feel like that. But it's not okay to be scared of it. You know what I mean? Like to not just try to go, why do I feel like this? You know, and they're just so afraid to step back to, am I making any sense at all? They're just afraid to really just examine this. And uh, because I think they've grown up, you know, like Obama's in the White House, this and that, you know, like all these weird things that, that mean something, but day to day don't mean a whole lot, you know? And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just, it just, you know, I was in the middle of writing the book when this conversation happened. But when he said it, it really shocked me. You know, just this whole sense of. Uh... It's funny because after we've had this conversation, so he, he this is, I don't know why I'm saying this. Do you guys know this show Breaking Bad? It's weird. I think it's an okay show, but I think it's like a really vehemently racist show against Mexican Americans. You know, the way they kill them, this whole thing. But he just enjoys the show. But when we started talking about 
what happens when they kill a white person on the show? What happened, you know, he just started really thinking about what he was seeing and these messages that he's getting. And he wrote a fantastic essay, but he just, no one taught him that it was just okay to look at stuff with this really critical eye. And uh, for me, that's really dangerous. It's not about whether you agree with me or not or anything, but just that sense of, yeah, you know, where do I really belong? And just refusing to, you know, just to look down on yourself and see where you are in this larger scheme. That just, uh, it was kind of hurtful to hear him say that in a weird way. Question. Um, so, hi. Hello. Sorry, can't see you. Um, so, considering that you, people would say your work is repertage, or this book is repertage, and also considering um, how time functions in the book and how it's also in the past and in the present and the future, would you consider it speculative? Yeah, I mean, it, look, it is a novel, so it's it's. Do you mean speculative in terms of like speculative? It's like world making, speculative. World. Like world, world making. World. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. World making. World making. Yeah, I hope okay. so. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do is make a world that's both fictitious and feels real. You know, like there's a verisimilitude to it. I think. I hope. You know. Uh, so I'm glad that you said that about the time. So, so I made like a, a really pointed thing to make it feel like it's in the future, make it feel like it's in the present a little bit. So I don't use, like, so I never mention the president. So I say the black president, you know, just, just to really make it all really fuzzy. And part of the reason why I didn't set it in Compton, why I created this fictional thing. So people wouldn't say, oh, I know this, I know this, and bring all these weird assumptions about shit. And... Yeah, it, it took me a long time to really do that and make the book still make sense chronologically in a weird way to make it feel fuzzy but at the same time very real. So uh, I hope that I've created this world that is fictional but feels like, for me, feels like L.A., as crazy as L.A. is, you know. And there's like a kind of surrealness to growing up in California that for me is unique, you know. So I hope that it is a little speculative in that way, I guess. Before I started writing, I was getting my doctorate in social psych. So, uh, I, you know, I just stopped to start writing because I realized writing is what I wanted to do. And uh, so, in graduate school, I came across this essay by a psychologist named William Cross. And he had this thing about how black identity is developed. And it's modeled like around how traditional identity is developed, but with all these things like, you basically start out as an Uncle Tom and then you become like, you know, Molotov throwing cocktail revolutionary. He wrote it like in 72, you know, that was like, and, uh, but it was, it was absolute genius. You know, it was really funny. I mean, because I find everything funny, so you have to forgive me on that. But it was just really smartly constructed. And, and back then, it's a long time ago, but I, I just love this little chart that he had, you know, about how you do this. And so I Xeroxed it and blew it up and made this big poster that I put on my room. And it's just something that has really stayed with me for a long time. So when I was thinking about the book, you know, originally I was going to pattern it around his stages of black identity development for this character, but it just didn't feel right. But it was just something that stayed with me and, uh, you know, and just, you know, me getting out a lot of my little bitterness about psych and all this other kind of stuff and the things I went through personally and professionally and 
and, 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 and just trying to test like how applicable is this to people of color, to education. I mean, I think that it is, but you know, I'm just trying to have fun with it a little bit. I, and I can't, I can't answer the question exactly, but <laughs> this is the best as I can do. Any other questions? Chart, um, you know, with some sort of guiding principle um, for you. You said it didn't really work well, but the reason I say that I haven't had the pleasure of reading the sellout, but um, I know the White Boy Shuffle and I know Tough, and both of those novels are, um, you know, coming of age novels. And it sounds like this novel is sort of a coming of age novel as well. I'm not sure. But I'm just wondering, is, is there something about coming of age that attracts you as an author? I, 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 it's interesting, because I don't see this as a coming of age novel, really. I mean, it's, I almost think of it as going back in time. I don't know what the reverse is, you know? But there is a, a thing. So, you know, when I first started writing, I remember, I think I was in Minneapolis, and something very similar. There was this smug little kid and his girlfriend staring at me, black kid, and he went, so are you a new Negro? You know, <laughs> I just went, first I just said, fuck you. But it's, <laughs> but it's this question of, for me, it's really interesting about how black art, black identity is always this new something. It's always post this, pre, you know, and I just, this is so nuts to me, you know, and I, I understand it a little bit. Like I understand the need to do that, but I, it's, for me, it's always like this, I don't even want to say two steps forward, one step back. I don't know how many steps it is. But it's this constant, sorry, re-examination of this. And then so, like when I was doing radio interviews, I would get upset, like somebody would say, oh, so are we post-racial? Is there segregation? And I went, I don't have time to start the conversation at this spot. I just, I can't do this over and over and over. So in part, the book is a part, there's a part in the book where, He's explained to this, you know, he's in the Supreme Court and this, this black woman's very upset with him and she's a teacher, she's got all her little kids, what kind of example are you saying? And he's thinking to himself, like, how do I explain where I'm at? And he says, it's just like, this, do you guys know this game, Shoots and Ladders? Yeah. And that's how I feel like it is a little bit. You know, you go down and, you know, we think that there's this weird dreamland of, like, there's no prejudice. I don't know what people want, you know what I mean? And whatever it is, it's not the same for everybody. But I just can't always start at square one. You know, I just, I refuse. So it just, in part of like when I wrote this, it was just like, I'm not making any concessions anywhere. You know, in terms of just what I want to say. Like, it's not like I'm not thinking about it or I'm not trying to be considerate. But I'm not trying to measure this. Well, how is this going to play here? How is this, you know? My sister said, she's a playwright, and my sister said something to me once that I thought was really smart. And she just said, you know, people are really smart. And she said, I went, yes, he's right. And so, you know, I just trust myself as a writer and hopefully trust my reader to see through this and like, this is where we are. You either catch up, maybe I'm behind you, but you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, just important to me somehow. And just, I just can't have this new Negro conversation every 10 years. You know, I just, yeah, so, yes. I kind of agree with you. Um, of course, the older you get, the more you see, it's good to say there's nothing new under the sun. It's just that people are just joining the party because they become aware. And I think some of it is generational in life experience um, and awareness. And so we always start at that, that, that first step, that, that beginning place that you talk about, and we always didn't seem to end up at <clears throat> because the people are just now getting to there. Which brings up another thought. I said, well, gee, maybe that's a conspiracy that we keep in this loop and we never move forward. You know, that's another thought. But nonetheless, um, I do agree with you on that. You get tired of the same old, the same old, and, and the discussion never seems to move forward any place. Thanks. Can I say one little thing? I don't know. Like, So I wrote this essay. I did this compilation of African-American humor called Hokum. And uh, like this, I don't know, this new Negro thing. Um, when I was in seventh grade, they sent a, a, a portion of the class, uh, Maya Angelou, Why the Cage Bird Sings. And I remember trying to read it, and I could not read it. I just, I was just, when I'm young, it's a hard book. But I was like, I'm living this. I don't need to read this. But so one of the things I realized is, 
is what little black literature I got was all in the same note. You know, it's all this morose, destitute, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying there's not a place for that. But like, I was like, it took me so long to find other satirical things, funny things. And it's interesting, there's a book called Oreo by a woman named Fran Ross that she wrote in the 70s. Do you know this book? It is the funniest, and it's a shame that this book is not a part of this, you know, the dirt swell, red clay kind of canon, because it's a genius book. And so part of this whole Negro, new Negro thing is you only get one slice of the thing. So anytime something doesn't fit that, people are like, oh, this is new, it's, you know, it's not new. You know, so that's like how, this, how we get presented this stuff, for me, can be real troublesome. I don't know, I just had to say that. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yes. So, um, you talked about Breaking Bad. Um, what other art right now is influencing you? What do you like in terms of TV, movie, play, music? What else are you doing outside of your writing? What other art do you really appreciate? Uh. Uh, I, I don't like very much. <laughs> so I'm like the wrong person to ask. There are things that I like, but there's not much that I really, really like that, you know. Uh, and I hate doing this because I'm going to say something and you're going to go, oh, that sucks. He's stupid. You know, so, which I understand because I do the same thing. But uh, like new stuff, that's tough for me. There's not much new. So like my favorite, one of my favorite TV shows is The Sopranos. You know, I just think just a smart way that, for me, it's about race and about drugs and about rehabilitation. I just love that show. And there's other things that I really like. You know, I, I love Japanese film and Japanese literature. And there's tons of things I like. And so, you know, and it's not about like whether it influences me, but I, I love the feeling because it happens to me so rarely when I see something really good or really moving and it makes my skin raise, you know, and I just go, man. And, that's something I try to capture when I'm writing, you know? And so it's not so much about what I like. I mean, I love jazz. I don't love much contemporary jazz, but that's because I'm old fashioned and stubborn. You know, this is like, a, we can have this private conversation. But for me, it's like, I don't read much contemporary literature. You know, somebody has to really put a book in my hand to make me read it. Um, it's not to say there isn't good stuff out there, but for me, it's getting harder and harder to find really good stuff, you know? Sorry about that. I know I didn't really answer <laughs> your question. That's actually a great answer. And the um, only thing I'll say is I found out that your book was out. I sent it to uh, my college roommate, and he was like, oh, wow. I've been, I've been waiting for something to come back out from him. I didn't know it was out. Thanks so much. He's already read 80 pages. So like your, your work, it just resonates with people and touches them in a way that's Special. Thank you, man. I, I, I really appreciate that. I do. We can end on that note. That's a good note. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you guys for coming out. And uh, yeah, it's chilly. And thank you. Thanks. Thank you.